This video was brought to you by us, Slidebean. Make beautiful slide presentations in no time. Get one free month by signing up at slidebean.com slash YouTube. Let me just say it, BlackBerry was huge. Celebrities love those phones. Kim Kardashian, Katy Perry, Justin Timberlake. Even Barack Obama used one for most of his two presidencies as it was considered safer than any other smartphone back then. From its QWERTY, actual physical keyboard to real-time emails, the BlackBerry was for many years the smartphone by choice, the company sold millions and they were riding high. And BlackBerry did a lot of things right, but they also did a lot of things wrong and now they're gone. And the reasons why BlackBerry failed aren't exclusive to them. So when one of the biggest phone companies plummets to oblivion, it's worth analyzing. So we are gonna cover the birth of BlackBerry, its fast growth and expansion, their tipping point, and finally their demise. So this is Startup Forensics, BlackBerry. How BlackBerry was born. BlackBerry was originally known as Research in Motion, RIM, and it had been around since 1984. RIM was the brainchild of Canadians Mike Lacerides and Douglas Friggin. From the start, RIM's obsession was wireless and their vision paid off early. They were the first of many things, protocol conversion, mobile point of sale, just to name a few. To help with growth, RIM hired Jim Balsili in 1992, who eventually became co-CEO with Lazaridis. Remember him, he was critical in BlackBerry's success and their demise. But let's get back to RIM. By 95, they drew enough attention from investors to fund their first wireless two-way paging system. Wireless paging, the idea was very enticing, as Adam Adamo, one of the main investors in the time, recalled. The idea of a wireless device to send and receive email was revolutionary. It was like looking into the future and knowing that this idea just made too much sense for it not to happen. And he was right. Prior to the IPO, RIM raised 30 million Canadian dollars, whatever that means, for the interactive pager, a pager and a wireless network system, which was released in 1996. One year later, Wireless for the Corporate User Magazine named it the top product of the year. RIM came up with the BlackBerry 850 pager and a complimentary server called the BlackBerry Enterprise Server, which was a genius idea. The server was exclusive to BlackBerry, so it could push emails fast, instantaneously fast. Now, there was no need to wait while your computer downloaded all the emails. Communication became instant, and businesses, of course, loved it. RIM aimed at the corporate world, and that was a good idea. A great idea. Then, they launched the BlackBerry 957, RIM's first true BlackBerry, though not a smartphone yet as it couldn't make calls, but it did have the iconic QWERTY keyboard, a famous user interface. Through improvements in 2003, they released the BlackBerry 7230 and it hit big. It had all the technology that made BlackBerry successful and now it could actually make calls. So much so that people consider this moment the birth of the BlackBerry smartphone, pivotal in communications. One of RIM's strongest selling points was safety. With promises of tougher encryption processes, they garnered the attention of major businesses and governments alike. During the next six years, BlackBerry grasped the corporate world and didn't let go. In fact, the devices were so addicting, they were called crackberries. Because corporations are healthy and wholesome. Hold on to this idea of corporations for later. By the way, the name BlackBerry comes from how the QWERTY keyboard resembled the actual BlackBerry fruit. So now you have some random factoids for awkward silences. As the years passed, BlackBerry became more advanced. They had cameras and new multimedia capabilities, which made them appealing to a much bigger audience, and a lot of people bought them. Growth and expansion. The early 2000s might have been unkind to fashion, but they were great for RIM. Assets grew by 8x, users went from 500,000 or so in 2003 to 4.9 million in 2006. That means sales grew by 10x. Back then, everybody in the corporate world had a BlackBerry, but not only them, teenagers as well. You see, combined with newer and better cameras, the BlackBerry messaging service, BBM, was perfect for adolescents. It could send images, voice notes, pictures, locations, create group chats, and of course, text. Does that sound familiar? That's right, they built WhatsApp before WhatsApp was a thing. That's how on point they were, and they could have carried on with their greatness. At its peak, the BlackBerry brand sold around 50 million devices per year with annual sales of almost 20 billion. Its stock rocketed from $2.15 per share to $150 per share. And celebrities craved Blackberries. Kim Kardashian had three, just in case one of them broke down. Pitbull rapped about his BBM blowing with messages. And before he joined Samsung, 
JC was bragging about BlackBerry and its connectivity overseas. But this is startup forensics, so not everything was fun and games. Though most of their models worked very well, such as the Pearl and the Curve, promising products like the Storm never delivered. The Storm was the first model with a full touchscreen and no keyboard. But since the OS was designed to work with a keyboard, it didn't really grasp touchscreens very well. It was sluggish and unresponsive and users hated it. Still, even if their newest phone was failing, sales piled up. So there was no reason to be worried, even when in 2007, Apple came up with a little device called the iPhone. At first, like most companies, RM was not afraid of the iPhone. Why would they be? Remember Steve Ballmer's reaction? <laughs> $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world. And it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. Yeah, those words can bite back. The tipping point. Let's give RIM some credit. Even after the introduction of the iPhone and up until 2011, sales of the BlackBerry increased. So they had reasons to be confident. It was just that Apple had a different strategy. And along with RIM's mistakes, it could prove deadly for BlackBerry. Let's go over those mistakes. Remember how BlackBerry was great for companies and teens alike? Companies loved connectivity and safety. Teens loved chatting with their friends. But when was the last time you heard somebody, anybody say, I'm looking for the most secure phone in the world? The average user didn't really focus on safety or security or privacy. So while RIM had the corporate market to itself, they didn't have much else. Read this lethal quote by journalist Vlad Savov. Focusing on the tens of millions of customers it already had, BlackBerry missed out on the billions that were to come. So who were these billions that were to come? Well, everybody else. Companies were finite and kids would get bored. Perhaps they might start using, I don't know, the iPhone. And this was the second big mistake, not listening to the market. Yeah, Apple wasn't the only company competing at this point, but they had a great idea and it was the complete opposite of what RIM preached. You see, Blackberries were great for working people. Their batteries lasted long hours, their data consumption was low, their bandwidth consumption as well. Boring but efficient apps were the norm. And Apple said, screw that. Their apps consumed loads of memory. Their phones hogged up all the bandwidth and the first batteries lasted a day tops. But their navigator Safari was easy to use. Apps were visually stunning and plentiful and the device just looked great. So people who weren't using their phones for business or didn't care about efficiency now had another option. Which leads us to the third mistake. BlackBerry was obsessed with that QWERTY keyboard, the physical keyboard. It's great for emails, but it's not great for pretty much anything else. And they didn't venture into a full touch screen until it was too late. But it's not just about keyboards. It's about everything. Lazaridis focused on limits, size, portability, bandwidth, battery. Everything had to be limited for efficiency. Well, it turned out that it was too limited. The OS was too restrictive for app developers, so the market was limited. In fact, most apps were stripped down versions of their Android or iOS counterparts, and they just didn't work properly. The OS itself was also hard to update, but ironically, updating it to make it more open to the market meant possibly losing some of the valued corporate customers because of security concerns. RIM took pride in safety until BBM crashed for four days straight and RIM didn't say a word about it until the third day. And then there was that unauthorized spyware infection to 150,000 BlackBerry users in the United Arab Emirates and other scandals. So with this bad press, BlackBerry was losing their identity. And still, Lazaridis and Vandal Siegel rejected switching to Android or iOS or even you know, the Windows operating system. Nor did they open BBM to competing for operating systems when they had the chance until WhatsApp showed up and killed it. Remember how WhatsApp sold for 19 billion? It's clear that their mindset was another reason for the shortcomings. Though they were co-CEOs, Balsil and Lazaridis sometimes didn't see eye to eye. Many blame this dynamic as the reason for their latest OS, BlackBerry's 10, delayed launch. So much that it was no longer competitive. RIM had the chance to innovate. They had great ideas and all they had to do was break away from the suit and tie. But they didn't. Again, they were too confident and too conservative. A deadly combination in this tech world. Here's another interesting quote from Balsiel. We're a very poorly diversified portfolio. It either goes to the moon or it crashes to earth, but it's making it to the moon pretty well. So we'll stick with it. Ouch. The demise and turnaround. People didn't want Blackberries anymore and that hit sales hard. They went from $20 billion in sales in 2011 to just half of that two years later. And 
it continued to fall. Apple and Android stormed the scene. Manufacturers such as HTC, Samsung, and Motorola were willing to provide devices for them, yet nobody wanted to work with BlackBerry. Or perhaps it was the other way around. It was so obvious that change had to happen. So in 2012, after three decades, both CEOs stepped down and Thorson Heinz took over. But guess what he said? We believe that BlackBerry cannot succeed if we try to be everybody's darling and all things to all people. Therefore, we plan to build on our strength. As strength, that was, well, the business world. Hadn't they learned anything? Plus, it's not like their efforts were enough. New phones like the Z30 were just okay. Their long-awaited BlackBerry OS was just okay. But nothing amazed us like it did in the past. Nothing amazed us like the stuff that Google and Apple were doing. So just one year later, Heinz was gone. Then came John Chen. He was a realist. The Priv was their last effort. It was Android-based, sleek, and very safe, but it failed. And after this failure, Chen decided BlackBerry would stop making phones and sold the manufacturing license to other companies. Massive layoffs ensued. The company's value plummeted with stock now trading at around $5. And the BlackBerry logo survives only in a handful of devices sold mostly in Asia. BlackBerry as we knew it was dead. Is that the end of the story? Well, no. Chen embraces BlackBerry's safety obsession, but now as a software company. And with this new direction, revenue has slowly increased in the past couple of years. So perhaps they'll make it. For now, all that we can say is that BlackBerry was the undisputable boss, but Technology evolves every day, and they weren't willing to go with the flow, which forced them to the bottom, where now they must fight their way back up.